Hello everyone, my name is Sasa Mijadovic and today I'll talk about how spending time on defining a problem is time well spent. I have over 20 years of business consulting and IT experience in successful delivery of profit-driven technology and professional services, mainly in the telecommunications industry. I work predominantly with Fortune 50 companies and a few startups where I led a multi-year business transformations and system modernization programs. My educational background is in applied mathematics. One of the recurring themes in enterprises today is the lack of time and focus invested in understanding and defining the presented problem. There is a similar challenge when introducing a new program into the organization. Organizations tend to jump into a solution too soon, usually due to natural inclination to show progress and contribute, or due to aggressive timelines, or limited budget and any other factors. And this often leads to solving the symptoms and byproducts of the core problem instead of the problem itself. As a result, we often create an inflexible, expensive, yet peripheral solutions. And here's an outcome of a typical program without the problem modeling or modeling at all for that matter. So if we look at this cartoon from left to right, we can see how the customer explained it, how the project leader understood it, how the engineer designed it, how the programmer wrote it, and certainly how the sales uh, executive described it, and how the project was documented, very interesting. What operations installed, how the customer was billed, how the help that supported, and what the customer real needs are. So if you compare the first bottom left, how the customer explained it, and what the customer really needed in the bottom right, that's the gap that we are trying to close with proper uh, problem modeling and problem definition. It is really hard to focus on a problem without offering or thinking about a solution. We have to train our minds to approach problem domain differently. It's paramount to define what needs to be solved and why it needs to be solved without focusing on how it is going to be done. Understanding a complex problem, defining it and destructuring it takes a deep understanding of its causation. Full mental engagement is required and application of the main experience and expertise to model the problem. And that's really what we're going to talk about today. And this process at times appears more passive because we are holding back from taking action to solve the problem. And keep in mind that problem modeling at times could take longer than proposing a solution. However, it is often a process of deduction, elimination, and simplification. As part of the problem-focused approach, let's look at the three main areas to consider for modeling problem domain, and these are not in any particular order. Number one is to embrace the unknown. In the beginner's mind, there are many possibilities. In the expert's mind, there are few. So approaching the problem domain with a beginner's mind is key. Cultivating that childlike curiosity and staying present is essential. Having a playful attitude allows for, I don't know, and I'm wrong disposition and um, us being okay with it, which actually sparks a different part of the brain. This is counterintuitive, especially for engineers, but this kind of approach stimulates the creative part of the brain that actually sparks innovation. The curious and playful mindset sets the stage for active listening. So what is active listening? That's when you engage all of your experience and expertise and senses, not to solve the problem, but rather to apply yourself to formulating and asking the right questions to further understand the problem. 
And other elements of active listening include staying neutral, staying non-judgmental, reflecting and repeating key points back to the stakeholder, having emotional intelligence to think about emotions behind the words when issues are described. Also visualizing what a stakeholder is communicating, paying attention to body language and maintaining an eye contact. And one of the important uh, practices is having patience, allowing the stakeholder to speak at some length while patiently listening. And all these techniques will keep your mind from drifting off into the solution domain. Because the minute we drift off, we are no longer capturing the problem. And that can create a gap in accurately modeling the problem definition. Number two is to strive for simplicity. Everything should be made as simple as possible, but not simpler. Oftentimes we encounter competing or even contradictory input from different stakeholders. And this is where deductive reasoning um, can serve us really well. And as you know, the deduction is a process where a conclusion is made based on the acceptance of number, premise, number of premises or general principles. We consider general information before we make certain conclusions. Deduction works very well when general information is true. So as long as you're getting input from the subject matter experts, employing deductive reasoning is very effective. Inductive reasoning obviously is important as well. And that includes specific observations, running experiments, recognizing patterns. Inductive reasoning also requires thinking in many different ways about the same situation and about the same problem. And especially trying to do so gradually and even seamlessly, swapping from one way to another way of thinking. And that really primes the brain for pattern recognition. Because this part of the inductive reasoning, the recognizing the patterns is a great way to simplify a problem. So in addition to sustained attention and withholding the response and being patient as part of active listening, speed of information processing that we receive is important. And also having cognitive flexibility. So being flexible with your stakeholders, it, if they change their story, um, you know, modify the setting, modify the inputs and attributes, and also being having that awareness and cognitive flexibility and give yourself permission to change your mind and shift your perspective and keep it very fluid while you're in a problem domain um, is a key while having multiple simultaneous attention. So all that I just described needs to happen across the board, working with multiple stakeholders. And as we train our brain and our mindset to behave in this way, um, we'll also experience category formation. Um, if we stay fluid and disciplined in this way, we will start forming categories. And out of forming categories, patterns will then be recognized. So then the very last step in uh, simplifying the problem is once you create categories and patterns start to emerge, you can work on raising the level of abstraction of the problem domain. And that's the most effective way to simplify the problem. Number three is to know the context. Without context, word and act, words and actions have no meaning at all. So really study the context. If I just use an everyday life example, let's say you are planning an adventure trip. So you have to decide, are you going skydiving or are you going scuba diving? You're still you, you haven't changed, 
but the environment of your adventure yields a completely different setup. You'll need a different gear. You'll need a different transportation to the site. You'll need a different skill set. And by the way, if you scuba dive, you'll be shocked to witness how agile a sea turtle is in the water. So context really matters, right? Another real life example is artwork and paintings. Uh, you know the notion, I'm sure you're familiar with the notion of positive and negative space, where positive space refers to the subject or area of interest in the artwork, like a portrait, or objects in a still life painting. And that negative space is the background or the area that surrounds the subject of this particular artwork. So system and its context are like that. And they're more like yin and yang. I mean, that's how closely coupled they are in a problem domain. And that's the importance that system context has when modeling a problem. It can, a system cannot exist without its context in the problem domain. So it really is like a yin yang. And then um, taking it to the next level and grasping the context's context. Okay, so just like the, taking it like a one level wider. So if we take yin yang, and ask what is its context? Is it hanging off the string as an ornament? Is it glued on a piece of paper and framed like an artwork or is it printed on a fabric? Is the yin yang two dimensional or three dimensional? You know, how does this yin and yang exist as a whole in its context? And it's really important the context's context really informs you really, really well. You really get familiar and, and you get to know the context. And if you're in this problem domain and you just brush over the context because it's very uncomfortable and very difficult to stay disciplined, to work on the context because people will not as value uh, the detailed work around the context, it's pretty good indicator. If you just brush over it, it's an indicator that you may be in a solutioning mode or in a solutioning mindset. So it's a very quick way to check in and to understand if you're problem solving or if you're solutioning. And lastly, it's really important to explore context evolution. And even if you um, today understand your context or your environment to be static, you just have to give it time. And, it, and it's, just gonna, it's just a matter of time for, uh, of, of it changing. So investing time to predict context changes is really important. And that goes without saying, if, you have a, if you're dealing with a dynamic environment or dynamic context, like let's say battlefield. In the battlefield, we know the um, natural environment, but the rest of the environment is quite dynamic and needs to be accounted for over and over in the system design. But regardless of what kind of context you're dealing with, it is really important to predict context changes. This will really help explain unanticipated events and help solve unanticipated events, as well as it will inform you of the potential future needs of the system. So you can problem solve in a context of um, evolution of the environment as well as the system itself. So in summary, a problem focused approach allows us to model the principles that underscore causation and it facilitates breakthrough solutions. Getting to the root of the problem is in fact inseparable part of its solution. So seize the problem domain by embracing the unknown, striving for simplicity, knowing the context while engaging the logical and intuitive parts of the brain, as we talked about. And these are not done in any particular order, but rather they are simultaneously employed to better understand and model the problem domain, regardless of what 
modeling methodology or tools are used. And remember, it's better to do the right problem the wrong way than the wrong problem the right way, as mathematician Richard Hamming points out. Once the problem is properly defined, even solving it in a wrong way, it's still a step closer to the solution. It simply means that the desired solution may require multiple iterations. So problem-focused approach makes it possible to circumvent the intermediate fix and leap into the aspired solution. Because as Charles Kettering famously said, a problem well stated is a problem half solved. Thank you.